please take a seat. Good afternoon. I see many kids and parents, so I guess it's time to start. It will be uh, an uh, exciting event for all of us. Okay. Um, welcome to everybody, everyone, the kids, first of all, but then the parents, adults, all the guests. It's a very special event. Welcome to the Getty. My name is Maristella Casciato. I work here at the Getty Research Institute, where I am the senior curator of the architecture collection. Now, the question is, why are you on stage today, what do you have to say? This is because the event this afternoon, Cornelius Funke's Adventures Through the Bauhaus, is part of a, of a series of uh, public programs related to the exhibition Bauhaus Beginnings, currently on display in the gallery um, of the Getty Research Institute, an exhibition that I curated with a small group of assistants. Now, what is Bauhaus? Uh, I give you a very, very short introduction. First of all, Bauhaus was a German art and design school. It was founded in 1919. This means that the exhibition Bauhaus Beginnings celebrate with this exhibition, we celebrate the 100th anniversary, 1919-2019, of the school foundation. Initially directed by Walter Gropius, a 35 years old architect, the Bauhaus sought to produce a new kind of artist to a curriculum that was blending theory, practice, workshops, very much related to what is going to be the part of our event today. The school well-known motto, learning by doing, emphasized the aim of achieving a new holistic education and to pursue good design. Bauhaus Beginnings, the exhibition, focuses on masters and students' pedagogical exchanges. It presents work produced in the preliminary courses at the beginning of the school through all the 14 years the school lasted. These exercises are based on a set of fundamental principles related to inter the interaction between form and colors, the geometrical figures, the study of the human body, and the achievement of an artistic uh, expression, abstraction in expression. The Getty Research Institute, this is the reason for this exhibition, holds an extensive collection of Bauhaus-related material. The students' work comprise one of the major components of the archival holdings and offer an unexplored opportunity for research on the Bauhaus innovative visual experiments. Now, the event this afternoon has very much to do with visual experiments. Our guest today is Cornelia Funke, who she has generously responded to our inquiry to create a colorful story in which her principal characters encounter a world of Bauhaus shapes, colors, and other unexpected figures on the occasion of a nocturnal visit. And now, a few words about Cornelia Funke, who is a celebrated fantasy and adventure writer, much beloved through all ages. Cornelia was born in Westphalia, Germany. Here is a, an initial connection to the Bauhaus. At the age of 11, she was determined to become an astronaut or at least a pilot. Then, at the age of 17, so be prepared, she thought that might be slightly selfish, and she trained as a social work, to be a social worker. 
And there, she started working with children in a suburb of Hamburg, where she was re realized that what was she really doing was to draw with the children and to tell them stories. So she decided to become an illustrator. And when she didn't like the stories that the publishers were sending in, she also decided to be a writer and a storyteller. She felt for a long time that she had betrayed the children she had once set out to help. So it makes her extremely happy, and I see we have a full uh, auditorium today, to tell story for children now all over the world. And she's so successful in her two professional that she can support many charities in the world to do the work with children she still believes is so important. So Cornelia tells her stories for all ages and she tells a story for us. She has been a very successful author, author of Dragon Rider, Thief Lord, the trilogy Ink World, and the Mirror World series. She lives in Malibu, in California, not far from here. We can even set up a visit to her in her avocado farm with her donkeys, ducks, dogs, and many other characters. A few couple of other words before I give the stage to Cornelia. I wish to thank Su Sang, scholarly program, and Johnny Tran, curatorial department at the Getty Research Institute for their commitment and assistance in making these events. It's really extremely, due to their commitment and the creative work they have done, that we have today Cornelia with us. At the end of the presentation, Cornelia will be happy to sign books. So if kids have their book and they want to have it signed, please line down and come to the stage and enjoy meeting Cornelia. We also have a reception for our children with craft project, plenty of color pencils and papers to color, so be happy through the whole program. The exhibition Bauhaus Beginnings will remain open for two more weeks. If you are interested, maybe the parents, who knows the kids as well, please sign up for a tour of the exhibition. And now, to be surprised, and without any further ado, please join me in welcoming our star of today, Cornelia Funke. I think, Maristella, you were the star. And she even has the star in her name. <laughs> in Italian, Stella means star. I still remember that right, right? And uh, we, let's also thank Johnny, because all the images you will see now, he put together, and he was so inventive in it that it just blew me away. So. <laughs> so I have written five of these stories about exhibits at the GRI by now. And you can imagine, it is not an easy task, because you have to put all the things in there that are in the exhibit. You cannot just tell a story. And it is, I see lots of you are very young, so usually I would now get a picture book out and read it. I, so I hope this story works for everybody, and I find a way to entertain all the ages. Please, everybody imagine, and I know that's far easier for the children, because grown-ups tend to forbid themselves to imagine things. It's night. And we're at the Getty, and none of you is here. Can you all imagine that? And there we are. The colors and the darkness. The sun had set in a lake of oranges and reds, and the night was claiming the sky 
wrapping the white fortress into star-studded fabrics of black and blue. All the tourists had left. No trams were coming up the hills. And just a few guards were strolling through the empty halls, filled with treasure and beauty, through the silent gardens and past empty chairs and tables. They barely cast a glance at the bluish light that was seeping out into the night through the high glass walls of the lobby, where during the day tourist groups gather and most visitors begin their journey. All the guards know whom the Getty belongs to once the sun sets. And they're all accustomed to the sight of glowing figures walking as effortlessly through windows and walls as the living walk through a door. For at nightfall, the ghosts of the Getty turn the lobby into their cafeteria. Many of them were hundreds of years old and speak languages that have long been forgotten in the world of the living. They've come with the treasures that fill the halls and vaults of the white fortress, as its inhabitants call the Getty. They've come with a vase or a painting, an old manuscript or a sketchbook, Many were human ones, artists, craftsmen, dealers. But as always, the tiny ghosts of mice and bookworms had also come to the lobby. A huge ghost of a long-forgotten god and the wood-hearted spirit of an ancient four-poster bed. They all greeted one ghostly guest with a respectful bow. He sat right in the middle of the vast room, William Dampier guardian of the White Fortress, actually the captain of them all, who in his lifetime, which had ended 304 years ago, had been a pirate, a writer, and an explorer. Dampier loved this hour, when the night high up on the hill filled with voices and faces from the past, and with all the immortal magic the mastery of artists can create. There was no death for this magic. No end to this song. The table Dampier was sitting at had been built by an Italian carpenter ghost. The distilled moonlight he was sipping from a silver chalice had been brewed by a dead alchemist. And there was a fabulous sword duel going on between the ghost of a famous Japanese samurai and a French musketeer. Ah, death was good. But just when Dampier took another sip of moonlight, he saw Coyote trotting into the crowded hall. Coyote never joined the festivities at the lobby. He was much older than the White Fortress and far more ancient a spirit than any of its ghosts, and he much preferred scaring rabbits and squirrels under the olive trees that grow around the Getty. When Coyote came to find Dampier, there was something going on, something unusual enough to alert the captain of the guard. Dampier sighed and empties his chalice. Yes, he had accepted that position years ago, and yes, usually he very much enjoyed it, although he had fought quite a few frightening ghosts and demons on his wake. But tonight, he sighed again. No, all he wanted was to watch a good sword fight and to sip his moonlight. He had just recovered from a nasty ghost cough, yes, ghosts get those as well. Sneezing and coughing is actually quite dangerous when your body is about as substantial as curtain gauze. Dampier had lost his head many times during the cough attacks, so he was really not in his most adventurous mood. I hope this is not one of your pranks, he growled when Coyote stopped at his table, or about some white woman whose 17th century robe got caught on a cactus. Coyote considers the cactus gardens of the Getty as his kingdom, which explains why many tourists report they were chased there by a golden-eyed, sharp-teethed demon. Uh, William, the director of the museum, had said to Dampier just a few years ago, nights ago, can you please ask Coyote to leave the tourists alone? But Dampier didn't know what to say to his old friend. After all, Coyote had already been the spirit of this hill long before the first white man had come to California. I see, Coyote purred with a sharp-teased smile. 
you're still in a foul mood because of that cold. No, I'm not here for a prank or one of those constantly weeping white women. There were quite a few at the Getty. Come, you want to see this, he growled. And before Dampier could find out more about what had caused him to forget about rabbits and squirrels, Coyote was already heading for the doors. So Dampier finished his moonlight drink, squeezed through a crowd of medieval knights and passed a seven-headed dragon, and followed Coyote outside. It was a chilly night, and Dampier immediately had to cough so hard that he once again lost his head and had to chase after it like a child who'd lost his ball. A strange sculpture stopped it from rolling down the stairs leading down to the tram. Ah, oh, I see you found it, Coyote snarled while Dampier put his head back in place with a pirate's curse that I cannot repeat here. The sculpture stood about as high as Dampier himself and was unlike anything he'd ever seen. It looked as if someone had built it from empty cans and used coffee cups and then wrapped it in yarns of many colors. Uh, they are all in seven sculptures, Coyote said. The others are even higher than this one, and I doubt that the daylight will make them disappear. They look rather solid. Disappear? A woman's voice asked. Why would you want my sculptures to disappear? I built them to, at la to last at least a dozen years. Don't underestimate the resilience of yarn. The ghost who stepped out from behind the sculpture seemed to be made from yarn. Her whole silhouette resembled a beautifully woven tapestry. Dampier had met ghosts before who choose a non-human experience, a appearance, although they've been human in their lifetime. Some take the shape of their favorite dress or their favorite book. At the West Pavilion, the ghost of a British conservator shows himself only in the shape of a Chinese teapot. <laughs> My name is Gunther Stolz, said the ghost. And I very much hope you're not some kind of ghost police who destroys pieces of art just because they were built from trash. Police, Coyote mocked. Do we look like police? We're the guardians of the White Fortress, and no, we won't take this down. But the rats may, as they consider all trash their property, and they love the yarn as upholstery for the nests. Gunther cast a worried look at her sculpture. But finally, she just shrugged. Well, that's fine then, she said. I can always build a new one. I like this place. But all these white walls, it could use some color and some weavings, my kind of weavings. Weavings, Dampier asked. He was more and more curious about this Gunther ghost. She had a strong German accent, and her silhouette showed the most extraordinary geometrical patterns. Even her face was covered with squares, cubicles, and multicolored waves. Well, I'll show you, Gunther said. And off she went towards the stone arch that led to the Getty Research Institute, William Dampier's home, since the GRI had acquired an old compass of his. Quite a few ghosts arrive at the Getty thanks to an object that was quite ordinary in their lifetime. A compass, a book, a shoe. Objects of little value that only time makes into treasure. Often our belongings store our memories more efficiently than our brains. And sometimes they may even preserve the essence of who we are. The cold had made Dampier stay inside for the last few nights in a vault deep down in the hill where he often went to study ancient maps, so he had missed how much the look of the GRI had changed. The usually colorless facade displayed orange, grass green, a velvety purple, and an ochre that resembled Coyote's winter fur. The Bauhaus had come to the Getty a school of artists that had bloomed only for 14 years, but had planted countless seeds into hearts and minds, and for all times changed how men built the houses and furniture, yes, even how we look at color. 
Ah, the Bauhaus, Dampier said to Coyote while they followed Gunther through the night. They had so much hope after the terrible war. The Bauhaus school burned like a bright and beautiful flame that would not even be extinguished by oceans of blood and human suffering. Dempier had lowered his voice, but Gunther had heard him. She stopped and gazed with surprise at the old pirate, whose clothes gave away that he had lived long before her time and the time of the Bauhaus. You know about us, she said. Of course, Dempier said. It is an advantage of the dead to know about things that happened long before and after their lifetime. I have a great fondness for all rainbow-colored flames that resisted barbarism and cruelty. This place guards many of those flames. Light and beauty were always preserved, even in the darkest times, in music, art, and books. Maybe these provisions will in the end be the only ones that outlast the human species. Gunther opened her well-woven mouth for a reply, but Coyote suddenly stood frozen on the spot and stared at the GRI facade. His fur was bristled, and he bared his fangs. One of the color squares, as orange as the fruit named after it, or was it the other way around, was turning black. The green square to its left was next. Then above it, two others turned. One square after the other was eaten by darkness. Ghosts can run very fast as they don't carry the weight of a living body and Gunther began to run. Wait, Dampier called, but she was clearly as courageous a ghost as she had been a courageous woman. When Dampier and Coyote reached the GRI, she had already disappeared through its white walls. Dampier uttered another of the countless curses he had learned in his pirate times and jumped through the wall. The lobby of the GRI, home of the receptionist and a gift shop, was filled with blackness. A sticky, breathing, chewing blackness. Gunther, Dampier called. Where are you? Here. A muffled voice came from the lab bag. My weavings! It's eating my weavings! Oh, this is disgusting, Coyote growled, as he appeared at Dampier's side. The blackness was leaking from the ceiling and poured out of the rooms to the left and right. I heard Gunther calling from the left, Dampier called, while he freed his arm from the gluey smears floating past him. The darkness seemed to not stick that easily to Coyote's fur, so Dampier stayed behind him while they made their way to the room that was usually the last one of the exhibits. They found Gunther maniacally wiping dark puddles of a vitrine that held beautifully colored weavings. The framed artwork on the walls had already disappeared under the darkness that seeped and dripped from walls and ceiling. Gunther, Dampier called. We have to get out of here. But the others, Gunther called back while she was wiping a blotch of black from her multicolored face. Annie, Vasily, Walter, Johannes, Friedel, they were all here. We have to search the other exhibition rooms. They tried, but they had to pass the lobby to get there, and the darkness filled it like tar. Not even Coyote could freeze paws from it. They had to hold on to each other to make it back to the doors, and only once they were outside and under the dark skies of the night, they were able to move freely again. They looked at each other, fighting for breath. Both Dampier and Gunther were covered with splashes of black. Only Coyote was still mostly yellow and brown, like the earth whose spirit he was. So what now? He barked. Any wise ideas, old pirate, before that ocean of darkness swallows at all? Mm, all the colors, Gunther moaned. All our beautiful colors, gone. We'll get them back, Dampier said. And we have to do it before the first tram comes up the hill, filled with humans who came to see those colors. And to learn about you, and Vasily, and Walter, and all the others. Lionel, don't forget Lionel Feininger. Gunther said. No one cuts images from wood quite like he does. 
and his paintings. Ah, oh, finding his colors sing. Coyote was not listening. At least he didn't look like it. Colors, he growled. Colors. Mm. They don't just exist on artists' palettes. Did you forget that they all come from outside? Why don't we bring them back from there? Reinforcements, one could say. Dampier cast a doubtful glance at the night sky and at the white stone the fortress was built from. Not even the tables and chairs under the trees had much more to offer than a glimpse of brown. But Gunther smiled. Coyote's right, she exclaimed. Just look at all the leaves. They hold plenty of green. And over there, the bright red blossoms of whatever plant that is. For sure, I've never seen it grow in Germany. Oh, she's an immigrant here too, Dampier said. She comes from South America and she has many names. Bougainvillea, Santa Rita, Bagambilash, Fayongfa. And she's a living thing, Gunther exclaimed. The source of all color. Look at Coyote's fur, it's still yellow, brown and gray. Whereas our clothes look as if someone dragged them through black mud. Maybe the colors of living things can fight this darkness better than colors on paper or canvas. Coyote smiled at Dampier. Oh, she's a clever human, his golden eyes said. Gunther was already gathering leaves and Dampier went to pile burning red bougainvillea in front of the GRI. Coyote, though, Coyote threw back his head and began to howl. His howl echoed so far and wide that it seemed as if even the constellations were answering him. And suddenly, his desert brown fur turned as dark as the night itself, and his whole body was shimmering with stars. Well, I'm not sure how that is supposed to help, Dampier said while he dropped another pile of thorny bougainvillea. I admit it looks very impressive, but don't you think we have enough black? Coyote cast him a mocking glance. Oh, Dampier, you ignorant old fool, he growled. Don't you know that the black of the night is made from all colors? Which gives me another idea. Gunther began to cover her woven body with leaves until she looked like a walking and very green tree. No, Dampier barked when she and Coyote looked at him expectantly. No, I definitely won't put flowers in my hair. I admit I did that in Tahiti, but that's more than 280 years ago. And I was a very young fool. I only agreed to get myself more colorful clothes. I guess the brighter we are, the longer it'll take the darkness to overtake us. Said and done. A red cloak from a Flemish painting, a turban, from an illuminated manuscript. The red shoes of a French king. Dampier looked like a tropical bird when they came back from the color quest and they didn't return to the GRI alone. They had dropped by at the lobby and a whole procession of ghosts followed them. A golden angel with green wings. The Mardi Gras crowds from one of the Getty's most famous paintings. Two warriors with bow and arrow, a huge rhinoceros and and even back a stack beetle, and many, many more. Oh, this is like one of our famous Bauhaus costume parties, Gunther exclaimed when the crowd swarmed towards the GRI. We had very famous parties. One was called the White Festival, and we had to be dressed um, two thirds in white and one third in colored dots or stripes. She smiled at the memory. And then, oh yes, there was the beard, nose, and heart party. That sounded especially intriguing to Dampier, as he had always disliked his nose. And he definitely wanted to meet the other Bauhaus ghosts who had been swallowed by the darkness. I fear I know what all that darkness comes from, my friend, he whispered into Coyote's pointed ear, while the rainbow-colored crowd poured through the arch and onto the plaza in front of the GRI. It's for sure not the black paint they put on the ceiling and some of the floors for this exhibit. No, Coyote whispered, stars shimmering in his night fur. I heard them too, marching boots and shots and screams, fear, anger, and despair, the shadows of two world wars, 
Then Pierre sighed and straightened his turban. Well, let's meet that darkness with many centuries of joy and color and wild song. Ghostly residents of the White Fortress, he called out loud. Friends in death and guardians of beauty, let's free the fresh and new ideas Gunther and her friends managed to grow in dark times. A roar, answered the old pirate, in many tongues and countless colors, and the ghosts of the Getty pour through the walls of the GRI like a band of jugglers and fire eaters. They laughed and sang and stomped out the darkness with dancing feet, and all the blackness became as velvety as the night in Coyote's fur, and finally it melted back into the walls and ceilings. Dampier was just chasing a last streak of darkness through the second room of the exhibit when a big blue square stumbled into his way, shaking off last bits of fading gray. Next, a yellow circle rolled out from under a vitrine and bumped Coyote off his paws, and a red triangle tumbled from the ceiling to land right in front of Dampier's boots. Heavens, be careful, Kandinsky, a very lean, cartoonish-looking man called, wiping some last flakes of darkness from his bright green sleeves. You almost killed our saviors. He smiled a wide welcome at Gunther, who came rushing into the room, dragging a few strands of unraveled yarn behind her. Oh, look, they are all well and unharmed, she cried, and gave Coyote and William Dampier such fierce hugs that they left plenty of yarn on his pirate sleeves. May I introduce old friends to new friends? Gunther pointed at the blue square. This is Walter Gropius, the founder of the Bauhaus. The blue square bowed, which was quite an extraordinary sight. And this, Gunther pointed with a smile at the yellow circle, is my dear friend and brilliant weaver, Annie Arndt. The circle, spun several times around itself, left a few weaving yellow lines on the floor and rolled off, which made Gunther put her arm around the red triangle. Voila, meet Vasily Kandinsky, whom some call the father of abstract art. The triangle did an impressive spin on its tip. And last, but for sure not least, the cartoonish man bowed so deep when Gunther pointed at him that his nose touched his knees. Lionel Feininger, painter, musician, woodcutter, cartoonist. More and more shapes emerged from the vitrines and frames on the walls, and Gunther kept introducing them. Helene Berner, Wilhelm Löber, Friedel Dicker Brandeis, Johannes Itten, Otti Berger. Dampier soon gave on rip up remembering all those names, though he was very moved to hear that one silhouette, who was half triangle and circle, was in fact Paul Klee, one of his favorite painters of all times. When Dampier began to teach the square, the circle, the triangle, and the cartoonish man a pirate dance, Gunther excused herself. I have to go to work, William Dampier, she said, with a quite a determined expression on her face. Work, Dampier asked, while the circle was jumping over his turban. But my dear Gunther, don't you want to celebrate with us? I will celebrate this night in my very own way, Gunther sighed. That's what artists do, William. But before I leave, may I ask Coyote for some of those stars in his fur, and you for that brightly colored turban of yours. She was, of course, granted both, and off she went into the night, where the GRI exploded with color and laughter. Two months later, William Dampier walked into the cafeteria that by day was the Getty's lobby, to find a huge and very beautiful tapestry hanging above the buffet tables. It showed how one memorable night, darkness had been beaten by color and despair by joy. Gunther had portrayed Dempia and Coyote very well, although she usually preferred more abstract patterns. They both had never looked better than in Gunther Stolz's threads and masterful weaving. Sadly, no living visitor of the Getty will ever see Gunther's tapestry, as it is only visible for ghosts and immortal eyes. There are many pieces of art at the Getty that you all can't see, as artists rarely stop creating just because they're dead. But if you walk over to the GRI to see the Bauhaus exhibition, you will at least get a glimpse 
at all the beauty and the art the ghosts and guardians of the White Fortress saved that night. And of course, you will find Gunther's weavings. What we always do after the stories, and before you uh, can follow the curators into the exhibit or draw the papers that we did, so the kids can color Walter Gropius or Kandinsky or whoever they want to put color on, uh, we always do some questions if you want or if you are in the mood for those. So whoever has one, I think there is a microphone around, right? So just raise your raise your hand and. Uh, I will try my best to answer them. Are there any questions? I think there's one up here. Is that a question coming out? <laughs> what? Is that a question? No. How long did it take you, I loved the story, and I'd be very interested in knowing how long it took you to write it, how many versions you did, any of that information about the process you used. When I do the Getty stories, I usually um, I take about a month to put the research together uh, to write the story. With this one, I had to leave for a promotion tour to Germany. I knew I don't have that much time, and luckily the story was very nice to me. So in all, I think it took me two to three uh, weeks and to do research and Maristella showed me the exhibit and of course with her enthusiasm, it's already half written. <laughs> so, uh, and then Johnny helped with visual materials, Sue did help, so it was wonderful to collaborate and I did in all our four drafts, which is for me low. But I read it aloud and it is, as the wonderful thing about shorter stories is you can just really polish them and then read them aloud and see how they work. So. Where did you get your ideas for the story? Well, the ideas, the good thing is when you have to write about an exhibit, I walked with Maristella through the exhibit and I thought, how can I explain the magic of this to children? Also, where did you get the idea from? When Coyote got his stars on him. I, I just saw it. I thought, what will Coyote do now? And I thought, you know, I have many Coyotes on my property. I live on an old farm in Malibu. And when they start howling at night, I hear them every night. So I thought, ooh, when they howl at the night, you know, the night comes down and will put him in a costume. Also, where did you get the picture of a Coyote? Because... Uh... The picture you have to ask Johnny for. Oh, that just sounds... <laughs> when you write your story, do you have to be in a specific state of mind or mood to be able to like think of what to write? Um, the wonderful thing when you work about a, a theme like this, you know, when I do the Getty stories, I already have a certain mood laid out. The Bauhaus story, of course, will feel very different than one about Louis XIV. So with that, it's very easy. If you write a book, you have to set the tone or you have to choose the, almost like the canvas on which you paint. But uh, the wonderful thing about these stories is each time I learn about something and I get very special tours. And uh, afterwards, I always give the finished notebook and you see this is what it looks like uh, to the Getty. So it will stay here. You recently did a, a collaboration with Guillermo del Toro with, um, with Labyrinth. How much freedom did you have in you know, creating a story that already existed in one form? How much were you able to play with that story? I like I it, know, oh, I I like it that you say in one form, in the most genius form, yes. right? Uh, um, that was an extraordinary adventure. I, I think I will never again have such a creative adventure. Um, I, I had worked with Guillermo before because he had asked me. 
uh, for a DreamWorks project, but, um, and we knew that we see the world in quite a similar way. And he knew that I love Pan's Labyrinth so passionately that for 10 years I had the poster hanging in my writing house. So when one day he had his manager call me and said, Cornelia, Guillermo has a request. Could you please turn Pan's Labyrinth into a book? I had to sit down, literally. And I thought, oh great, this is an impossible task. This is a genius movie you cannot shrink into words. But you, as we all know from fairy tales, you can never say no to impossible tasks. So I, ha I wrote it, watching the movie stop second, second by second, frame by frame. I never worked from a script. And I tried, as an illustrator and painter myself, to take every single image and turn it into words. And when I told Guillermo that's my method, he looked utterly disappointed, like a child I had told Christmas is over. Okay? <laughs> and he said, but I want you to play. I said, no, this is the holy grail for me. This is the movie of all movies. This is so perfect, I will not play. I will add the thoughts of the characters. I hope I get them right. I will describe the landscape. I will not add one beat. And he looked so devastated. And I said, Guillermo, that's the only way I can do it. I said, I could add 10 short stories on, based on key elements of the movie. <laughs> he, uh, interludes. I said, yes, interludes. He said, OK, I'm fine with that. So this is how we agreed on it. Then I wrote the whole story. I sent him the whole thing. And of course, I was most nervous about the stories, because those were the ones I had made up. And I sent him the first one. And the only thing I got back was one line. And it said, fly on with silver wings. <laughs> and I thought, OK, I guess that's an OK. <laughs> and I heard, and of course, you can imagine how that touched me, that he said, I completed the universe. And to do that for a thing you love, and I love this movie so passionately. It's for me what fantasy can do. Be incredibly political, be passionate about good and evil, and to be powerful and poetic. That, that I found words for it is still for me quite unbelievable. And I was for the first time a translated author in Germany because I wrote it in English. Yeah. So yeah, that will be an unforgettable adventure forever. Was the pirate actually real? Well, the interesting thing is, William Dampier was a real pirate. You could look him up. You can find the painting of him, paintings of him on the internet. So I took a person who is a historical person, and I can very much imagine that uh, he's a ghost at the Getty. I could actually imagine that there are many ghosts here. Why do well, how do you know that ghosts are not seeable? That's totally, I heard totally different things. Well, I, I heard that some of them look absolutely real. Well, <laughs> well we can argue at the, uh, about this for the rest of the day. We will have no proof unless a ghost shows up and proves us what's right, right? Yes. So, so you see. When the Why did the coyote have stars. Oh, why the, why the coyote had stars in his, his fur? Because coyote is the spirit of this mountain. And when he howls at the, at the stars, they come down. Because he is almost made of the same fabric that the stars are made from. Is that an advice that you would give young uh, writers? Yeah. Sorry? What's some advice that you would give young writers? OK, I will give you advice now, and you will think, oh my god, she's so old. That's of course what she says. <laughs> OK, so first of all, never, ever write your first draft on a computer. Deadly sin. <laughs> OK? That kills your story right at the start. So you get a notebook, get a nice one, make it nice. It should be at least A4. You write only on the right page, leave always the left one blank, because you will have to revise and, and, and 
you know, scribble all over it and add whole passages and work and play with it, okay? Your handwriting may look awful first, but you have to practice. And you will realize one thing, that when you let your hand write, first of all, the first draft will be much better. Secondly, you will never forget that this is a first draft and the story is not yet ready for print. The computer will fool you and will show it to you in such perfect shape that you think you don't have to work on it anymore, which is terrible. <laughs> so you, then you rewrite it about eight to 10 times and then you may have some good text. And eight or 10 times you can do in the computer. Okay? Yeah. Um, before, before you started writing, what was a favorite book that you really liked? Uh, my favorite book, I, I think from the age of 14 or 15 onwards, was The Once and Future King by T.H. White. It's a retelling of the King Arthur myth. And as I was obsessed with knights, I was obsessed with that book. Absolutely, I still love it. And The Princess Bride, actually. I really like The Princess Bride, too. Um, why did you decide those particular ghosts? Why did I decide to? Why did you, why did you decide those particular ghosts? Oh, the, uh, the particular ghost? Sorry, I didn't get the question. The story? No, yeah. it's just me not hearing you properly. So, so why did I decide to use these particular ghosts? Mm -hmm. Well, we, this is the fifth story I write for the Getty. And I've, I thought with the first one, hmm, hmm, who would be the guardian of treasure at the Getty? Uh, it, he should be a pirate because he feels guilty that he was a pirate and that he stole treasure. So now he guards it to make up for it. So I looked online for pirates who were also explorers, and I found William Dampier, and I couldn't believe he's real. And I thought, oh, he's perfect. And maybe they brought a compass here, and he was in the compass, and that's how he came here. So I decided that. Then I thought, yeah, but the Getty is rather young. It hasn't been here for that long. So this hill was before that, a wild hill. There must be a spirit who's much older than the Getty. So I came to choose the coyote. And as I see them all the time on my property, I'm very familiar with them. They climb my avocado trees. <laughs> they love to eat them. Um, what was the longest book you've ever written? Ah, I think that's Ink Death. That's the third book of the Ink Heart trilogy. And I think it has about mm, 70, 50 pages. Some 750 pages. Yes. How old is this book? Do you mean the story? Yes, the story. I would say the story is about six weeks old. <laughs> yeah, it's one of my young ones. So, are, we, are you all done? Is it your baby? <laughs> of course, what were you saying? Yeah! <laughs> oh, what try do you try and get to get out of me? That is true. Actually, all my books are my babies. But they grow pretty fast. They grow much faster than you. Yes? Are we able to purchase this story? Well, that has been a problem from the beginning, right? We tried to convince the Getty Publishing at some point to make it like into a book and have it in the bookstore, but so far we couldn't convince them because they're not really... Hmm? What can we do to help them? Yeah, please, yeah, write to the website or something, right? Because I would give it for free to them. I do this for free for the Getty because I love what they do, you know? So it's, there's no money in, in it for me. And we try to convince them. But, but so, because of course they have no specialty in children's book publishing, you know? But interestingly now, I have my German publisher and a publisher from London very interested in these stories. So it may happen, we are currently thinking of how we could do it, because of course the problem is they are always tailored for the exhibit. So does one include photo? Does one include illustration? I almost think one should do illustration of the art and then by now it's five stories, so it would already be a book. 
So please keep your fingers crossed. Yeah. And I think on the website you can also online find it and read it. Why is why is the why is why 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 do, why does why do the stars come on coyote when he when you know. when when he when he howls at the stars? I love it very much that you all ask about that because I remember when I wrote the story, it felt almost as if the story told me. And I have no idea where that idea where that came from. It felt almost as if the stars are coming down for me. And come on, we would all like to be able to do that, right? And I very much appreciate that you look almost like a ghost. <laughs> yes. Why it, why it is the pirate a ghost? Well, he died 304 years ago. And he felt he had some unfinished business on Earth, so he stayed. And he actually really enjoys working at the Getty. <laughs> Johnny's like, I'm not sure I would haunt the Getty. Let's see. Maybe I would find a more adventurous place even. <laughs> oh, can, you all, can you please get up and show them your jacket? Look at, he made this jacket himself. He painted it himself. Is that so beautiful? <laughs> it's so amazing. It's so good. It's true. You see, so you, we should have asked Johnny how he does it. <laughs> well, I know that's Konya, but that is Johnny. And you see what he has on his jacket? It almost looks like stars. OK. Yes. Are you working on any more books? And if so, what are they about? Yeah, I cannot do anything. I always have to work on a book. So at the moment, I'm working on the fourth book of my Reckless series. And um, that is a series that is about a treasure hunter in a, in a world that looks very much like ours around uh, 1860. And uh, he chases all the treasure from fairy tales. And the fourth book is set in Japan. So I'm writing that at the moment. And then I'm preparing the next part of Dragon Rider, which will be set in Malibu, and will deal with creatures from the sea. And uh, I am preparing a sequel of my ink books. And then I'm doing things like this in between. Are we all done? Do you start yearning for the sun? Okay. Yeah? What book are you reading right now? What I'm reading or writing? Reading. Oh, reading. Well, I am actually reading a nonfiction mostly when I write because I don't want to get the language. So I'm reading a book about weed and not the weed you are thinking about right now. <laughs> the weeds. <laughs> And about the definition of what plants we think to be useful and what not. Living on six acres, you are very interested in things like that. <laughs> so, oh, I forgot. I'm actually also working on a very interesting project, very new for me. I'm working on a plant book about 15 plants for children with an herb farmer from Colorado. Yeah, and she knows, she grows a thousand different herbs and plants. And I learn a lot from Tammy. Yeah, and we're having so much fun writing about dandelions. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, I'm doing that too. Okay, so. Uh, did anybody bring a book? Okay, then you just come. Yeah, I will just be here, and, and, and then I think we prepared the printout so that if you want to do some coloring of Bauhaus artists, I, I painted their faces into squares and circles. And, yes. And ha have a look at, 
and have a look at the Bauhaus exhibit. There's a fantastic video about one of our ballets they did, which I think the children will enjoy. Thank you. Thank you all.